Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. All right. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. Right. How did I get here? <laughs> You know, I was out with my son and William, and there was lightning, and, and, and it came down the kite we had out there, and it came through the key and it zapped me. And I woke up later, and, and I was back to the future. I was disapparated. And I woke up, and I met some young people. Howie, his name, Howie, historian, and uh, Bob Banker, and Michael, Mary, and Mary had a camera and he made a little film of a conversation we had. I hope you can see it sometime. And it was about all everything, they're telling me everything that was going on since I've been gone. So I've been catching up over these many days, not that many, and I've been learning about everything and I have some things to share. So I'm gonna to talk to you about my life in the 18th century and in light, I've had a busy life, but in light of what, what your cause is. So let's get started. I was born in January 6, 1706. My father was very productive. He had 18 children and I was the 16th. <laughs> Two wives. <laughs> I grew up, and my father was a candle maker, but I loved reading, I loved writing, and my older brother James was working in the printing business. And I felt, gee, that's, that was more suited for me. So I went work, to work with him at the, you know, the tender age, 13, 14, 15 years old. And I started writing. And I would even try to get things into the newspaper. And I was pretty successful with this. And I, I kept going that way. And my, James and I, all, we didn't get along all the time. So I wanted to start my own business, but I couldn't interfere with him in Boston. So I was going to have to strike out on my own. I went to New York. And I ended up being in Philadelphia. And I met the governor, Keith, and he said, go to England and, be, and I'll, I'll help you over there. And he, I did that. I spent about a year, year, two years in, in England learning the printing business. And then I came back here, 1725, 1726, and I started learning about everything going on in Philadelphia. And I got to print my first book by Francis Rawls, who talked about having a paper money system in Pennsylvania. And I started learning and reading everything I could. And it was 1723 that Pennsylvania started its paper money system. They brought in two issues of money. It was 45,000 pounds total, 7,500 pounds they spent into circulation, straight up. And that money was no debt to anybody. It was, as they're talking about, it was a positive money. It wasn't associated with any commodity or gold or silver. It was the money. And the other 37,500 pounds was loaned into circulation by people with land or a house, and they could borrow or obtain the money and use half the value of their house or a third the value of their land as collateral. And that went on. And we had a problem though. When the money was paid back, when the money was paid back, we were burning it, literally burning it. And, and it took us only a year year and a half, two years, to start suffering again because 
as we were burning it, we were very happy and, and working hard and we were becoming industrious. And being industrious and working is at the core of my belief system. That was, that was my religion. And we were working and, and doing good things, but we didn't have the, the money, the interest money to pay it back. And we could see we were going to be about 11, 1,200 pounds short and money was getting tight again within a year and a half. So by 1726, we had to write another law that said all the remaining money will not be burnt, but it will stay in circulation. So when people pay it back, we can lend it out again. It wasn't going to be burnt, and we weren't going to end the experiment with paper money, but we were going to keep it going. And one of the things that was different about how we did it, and it was written in our law right from 1723, was that this money was not going to be for war or for the king's use to go to war, but it was going to be for the poor and industrious people. And we had a cap on our loans at 200 pounds, down to 12, the lowest loan was 12.5 pounds. And it was to get people working, to bring the logs off the farm, to cut down some forest, to bring it to the shipbuilding to get agriculture, to get the English woolens and, and metal implements we needed off the ports as a medium of exchange. We, we were very happy, but, but our population grew and we were going to be needing more money. So things were tight. And it was Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland are the three colonies that did not create money for war. They created money for work, jobs, peace, prosperity. In Massachusetts Bay Colony, New England area, they created money starting back in 1690 under the English, the Kings used King William's War to go to, go to Quebec and fight. 2,000 soldiers, 32 ships. It was a lot of effort to go to war. And what did they get out of it? And that's when paper money, they, they lost that war and the people, the soldiers came back. Where's our money? Where's the promises? The merchants wanted their goods and, and the crown did not have the money, the silver and the gold, so they, had, they created a paper money system. That's the start. And then New York in 1709, created money to go to war again to fight the Canadians, and twice. And guess what? They created money to get out of debt, but they were so much in debt, they didn't create enough money. But the interest earned off that money for New York helped to pay off those debts as they came due. A story of, of what I'm hearing what's going may happen when things transpire here. So if New York can get through its debt, Maybe your modern society here can get through its debt by paying off the bond and the bills as they're due. So by 1729, things are getting pretty tight. I'm 23 years old, but I've got a fire in me. And I write the necessity of a paper money system in society. And in it, I talked about labor, I talked about the Greeks and I talked about the Romans. And I talked <coughs> even about tobacco, which they were using as money in Maryland. And, and we, I talked about value. And value comes from work. It comes from labor. And having a medium of exchange allows us to trade and move things around. And so Isaac Norris and the other conservatives and those who had money, they were trying to conspire against this. And they tried to figure it out and they said, we can't fight this, we can't argue. And people are loving the paper money system, we're going to have to go along with it. And we're not going to get our 8% interest rate anymore. <laughs> But, but we're going to have a lot of productivity and we'll make some money on the trades. So by 1731, we have another issue of money. And in 1731, too, 
in our neighboring colony, Maryland, they tried the same thing. Except they ran into problems and they couldn't get it past Lord Baltimore, their governor from England. They were having bad luck. So early in, things went on, and by early 1733, Lord Baltimore was going through the province and could see the dire need of people. And the price of tobacco, which was their money, had during the 1720s been falling and falling and falling because people were, were making good productivity of it. But it, it overwhelmed the markets and the price bottomed out. And they were suffering. Well, what was to be done? They talked about burning so much of it. But, I, but they couldn't agree on anything. And it took them two years. And Lord Baltimore felt so bad in, in 1733 that he said, we've got to do something directly for the people. And so he gave permission and Maryland struck out, issued 90,000 pounds and 48,000 pounds were just given out to the, every person, every soul and it was at the rate of 30 shillings per person because people just needed money to get exchanges going. The remaining 42 or plus thousand pounds, we loaned that, they would loan that in the same way Pennsylvania did, as, as, as what I call coined money or coined land. It was coined land and that became the money system. So it was a combination of spending money into circulation and lending it into circulation and government living off the interest rate for both colonies. In Maryland, they went until about 15 years, 1748, before they needed another money issue. And they had a problem too that in the beginning, they only kept tobacco and gold and silver as legal tender and paper money didn't have that status. You couldn't pay your taxes. You couldn't even pay your church bills with it. So it, had, it was just a local medium. But by 1748, they decide, we've got to make this legal tender too. So in Maryland, they had won, I hear what you call, like citizen's dividend or citizen's credit. Well, that's 1733, and it took place, and it brought life to to the colony of Maryland when there was huge suffering. And it took place in Pennsylvania. Our mayor in 1721, Dickinson, said, I don't know how we're going to get through the winter. And the first time I visited Philadelphia in 1723, I remember walking down the streets with a roll of bread in my hand and looking at the number of empty shops, places to rent, but people weren't taking that up. I was wondering what's going on here. But then they got a money system going, and it, it breathed to life. And this was important. So, in 1739, there's another issue of money in Pennsylvania, and we're up to around 80,000 pounds in permanent circulation. It was 38 something, and then we added exact amount to go to 80,000 pounds in circulation for people to go to work, not for war, but for peace, for, for good things. We kept getting pressure from England that the French are coming in on our territory, that there's Indian problems, and the king is always asking to go to war. Well, I, I joined the Quakers, and later in life I be, was the leader of the Quaker party in Pennsylvania. But we were deciding we didn't want to go for war. But every once in a while we had to give in for the king's use because of the pressures. So in 1745, we admitted 5,000 pounds for the king's use so he could fight the French. It was a small amount of money, and it was hard for us to do it, but we did it. Things went on in the 1750s. I should say, I get married to my lovely wife, Deborah, and she's a lifelong support, and she adopts my son, William, and that was a wonderful thing. And, and we, we are 
we were living on Third Street by Second Street, and, and we're doing lots of good around Philadelphia, trying to create post offices and fires and cleaning departments and doing a lot of good work. I believed in industry, and we've got people working to create industry all around Philadelphia. So that by 1739, 1740, Adam Smith is even saying, Pennsylvania is the wealthiest place on earth. Whereas a Dickinson in 21, 1721 says, I don't know how we're going to get through the winter. That's what it can happen when you control your money. I'm an open book. So I didn't do things that were always towards the good of the colonies. And I'm going to give you an example of that shortly. In the 1750s, as you well know, there's the French-Indian War. And the French have taken over or are building forts in the Ohio Valley. And we don't know how distant west Pennsylvania goes. There's no solid boundary out to the west. So we're trying to figure it out. But the French are there. <laughs> and they're building forts. And they're making good deals with the Indians trading. And they're beginning to step on our frontiers people, even just to the north in northern Pennsylvania. We're feeling the pressure. And I'm working with the English governor. And as much as we don't get along, but I'm working with them. And we're trying to make things work out. I then work with, uh, I met with uh, the General Howe and, and early on and some other generals to help with supplying provisions to the British troops as they stay in Philadelphia and as they need supplies. They needed 200 wagons. Maryland could only find 50 wagons for them. I was able to work and talk to people and say, hey, they're going to requisition it. Let's just get it at rent. We need 150 wagons. We can pay this amount. And we got it right away. And they were very happy. We were, the English were, were very happy with us. But then they lose their battles with the French in 56. And then we're at outright war. And during that war, we admit over another 300,000, 400,000 about pounds during the French-Indian War from 1755 uh, to 1760. And that money is being used to go to war. In North America, that war ends around 1760. And to 1763, it sort of goes on in Europe. But it sort of ended here. And we're preparing for peace again. We're, and by hook or by crook and by different agreements, we start withdrawing that money, that huge amount of money in circulation to cut down on inflation. We understood having too much money or too little money. We were learning from the other colonies. We learned from ourselves. It was like a money laboratory going on, so many different things going on. We were learning all the time. We became, I think, pretty good because it was new, and we were very conscientious about it. So in 1763, the war is ending. We're reducing the money only by 25,000. But it was enough because the population's growing and we've got work to do. And it was a medium that still is very much needed. At this time, the Quaker Party has had it with Thomas Penn, William Penn's son. And they, they want to get out from under it. It, it, he, he, it wasn't working. He stayed in England. He was making money as the proprietor. And he was, couldn't get a, wouldn't be even taxed a little by the body to help pay for the king's wars. We were always fighting with him. And he was always being negative. And he, he told the governor to be negative. So we had to contend with this. But even the Quaker Party themselves, even though they didn't want to go to war, and they, they in the in 1750s, and 10 Quakers walked out because they didn't want to go to war. They didn't want to start something new. 
but we reformed in the 1760s. We, in, we brought the, the party back to life again after some defeats, including my defeat. I only lost one election but as assemblyman. But then we gained it back, and we, we started thinking, and the Quakers voted, and the people petitioned that we would no longer be a proprietary. We were ready to go back to being under the crown solely because the other colonies under the crown were doing better. And every, everyone strongly voted for this finally and came to that consensus. And so in 1765, I was sent as a commissioner to England to promote this idea. And I had to deal with Thomas Penn. I had to deal with the very uh, Whitehall and other ministries there. I had a wonderful time. I was with my grand, uh, grandchildren and, and William Penn, or uh, William, my son, on, on an earlier trip there. So we had a wonderful time. I loved England. I wanted to retire there and live there. They were, I was getting accolades and, you know, from my inventions, ideas. I was, I was in the Royal Societies honorary doctors. I was having a great time there. I was thinking, gee, I could retire here. But things began to change. By 1765, they passed the Stamp Act. When they passed that Stamp Act, it was a tax. Now, think about that. It was a tax on stamps and on movement. And I was the postmaster. I was against this tax. We had not been taxed in the colonies. The only taxes in the colonies were us creating our own taxes. And we would have sometimes a head tax, a poll tax. Uh, we had tax on alcohol. We had taxes on, in Pennsylvania, if you wanted to bring a slave. We had a high bounty on, or a high import tax on that that we raised to 20 pounds to discourage it. And, and when we created our money, we were able to get rid of the property tax. We got rid of the poll tax. We only kept the two small taxes because they were social in nature. But, the stamp, but this is what we did ourselves. Those taxes were never imposed. The only thing we were doing for the king, <coughs> for the king's use, was taxing ourselves or creating money for his use in the colonies. We were nowhere being taxed uh, by Parliament. And so this was new. And we were going to be against it. We were strongly against it. Nobody wants to be taxed. Nobody wants to be taxed today. No one wanted to be taxed to them. So we are causing trouble. And by seven, after the Stamp Act, goes in and, and it gets rescinded partly. They have the Townsend Act. Now they're taxing paper, lead, glass, paint. <laughs> They'll tax the seat of your pants. <laughs> what are we going to do? We, we're not used to this. Now we're getting rebellious. And by 1769, they're sending in troops into Boston. I didn't want war. So in 1765, I spill the beans. I tell the ministry, the, the, the head of ministry, who's imposing the tax upon us, I say, don't tax us. If you want money, start a Bank of North America. And guess what? You can have a single currency. You can make your own bills of credit for the whole darn place from Canada down to the East West Islands and the Caribbean. You can have your own money. And you can put it out into circulation at interest. You'll make loads. You, the, the taxes won't even be needed. That's where the real money is. And you know what happened after I told them that? I had the same problem as you do today. Nobody was listening. And, <laughs> I gave them the keys to the castle, and they weren't listening. But, and I talked to MPs, the members of parliament. I said, what's going on? I tried to talk, put sense 
And they said, I really don't want, I didn't want to put those taxes on the colonies, but I had to do it for the honor of England. Yes. I said, you're killing us. Why don't you just send in military forces? And you can tax us all you like as you please. That's what's going to be happening. So my mission in England, I gave up my ideas to go under the crown for Pennsylvania. And now I had to think about more serious things. And I started writing letters to the Boston Chronicle. I even wrote letters to the London paper saying, this isn't the direction we need to go in. What, we, there has to be a better way. But when I wrote to the American colonies, I told them, look forward, see what's coming. And later in early 1770s, I'm in England and things aren't getting better. I'm telling the people, if you make yourselves into sheep, the wolves will eat you. And then I made another phrase, God helps those that helps themselves. They were getting the message. We worked on olive branches. We worked on just trying to create the peace, and they wouldn't have it. I sat in rage. I went to Parliament, I sat in rage, and I heard them in 1774 and 75 in March debunk us. They debunked our character. They debunked our religion. They debunked our thinking, our thoughts. I sat in rage, silent rage. My wife had just died. Deborah died in December of 73, and now it's March. It's time to go. I've tried, I've even tried a few months ago to try to think about peace. There's now no peace. I'm fully convinced. And I can see it coming stronger than almost anyone. I get on, I get on a ship with, with my family, and, and as much as I started loving England, I knew we were going towards war. I get back into Philadelphia, and bells are ringing, and people are so happy I'm back. I felt so good. But I had to get off that boat running. I went into a secret committee became a commissioner to Canada to see on what side they, they were going <coughs> to, if things got ugly, where were they, were they going to join the colonies or not? They weren't ready to do that. And in the secret committee, I also had to work on being in charge of the postal system. How are we going to move postals, but now think intelligence? How are we going to move intelligence and ideas from Georgia to New England? and I worked on setting up a system for this. We were getting ready. We were working on munitions. We would know we were going to take some heavy hits, but we, we were sure to our core that we were going to win in the long run. We were just too good. And I reminded them back in England, you know, you put 25,000 troops into the field to fight the French Indian War. We also, Matched you. We put 25,000 troops into that war too in the 1750s. What are you going to start now? And I had to listen in, in that silent rage. And I can feel your silent rage too, because the difference is today the wolves are eating you. <laughs> what are you going to do? So we went to war and the revolution took place, and as you know, there was a favorable outcome. I went on the various, later in the 1880s, I went on the Constitutional Convention, and I was suffering with lots of different bouts of gout. They say it comes from alcohol, and a lot of meat and good, good living. <laughs> I might be guilty. <laughs> When I sent up the junta with my friends in the late 1720s to see how to do good for society, we looked at different virtues. And I sort of looked at morality, and I said, well, let's not think about, let's think about civic duty. <laughs> we'll figure things out. But 
but I lived a life of civic duty. And it was often, during the war, they sent me back to live in France. And I let that persona go because the French loved it. The French loved my smile. I was their darling. And we worked with them and worked with them and they would, they didn't do it openly but secretly. They were doing everything they could, helping getting munitions, munitions in, helping us move things, and then when the time come, uh, helped us at key points. So that was good work. And then we worked to build our United States. And when Jefferson is writing, and I come back, and he says, and I'm suffering from gout then too, and he says, can you look at this Declaration of Independence at the time, he says. And he's, you know, and, and my enemies would often call me BF, the proprietary party who's